Good evening to everyone who's joining us. We're opening up and letting people in. So waiting a few minutes, see how, who joins us today. Greetings to everyone. If it's morning or evening or late in the evening, if you're from the, from the East, uh, let us know where you're from and uh, say hello while we wait for everybody. We'd love to hear from you all. Usually Jay would be on doing this with us this morning, this afternoon. Um, he sends his regards. He's not feeling so well today. So I will be um, uh, filling in for him. My name is Alan. I'm the director of the Jerusalem Bird Observatory. And uh, happy to see everybody clicking on. Let us know where you're from. I see that people are still coming in. Yoav, I don't see anything. Um, you're all set to go. So welcome everybody to the Jerusalem, uh, sorry, to the Society for the Protection of Nature in Israel. Okay, people are telling me the chat is disabled. Let me fix that, hang on one second. Let's see if I can get that going. I think it's okay that the chat is disabled. Um, people can use the Q&A probably. Yeah, okay, we'll do that. Um, so, um, hello, Lori from, from California. And I see we have uh, from Wisconsin with us today. Hi, the Burston, several people here from Israel. Um, so send us to the uh, Q&A, let us know where you're from, where you're hanging in from, and we're gonna give uh, one more minute just to let people in. Maryland, Marsha, hello, Yanina, y Yanaka, Sikha from British Columbia, Paul from Germany, hello, Daniel from London, Cedric from Luxembourg, welcome, Jane from New Mexico, People are all over, all over the map. Anat, hi from Tel Aviv, but we see you. Martha, hello from Alabama. It's good to see you again. Like I said, my name is Alan. I'm the director of the Jerusalem Bird Observatory, and we're happy to be coming to you live from Israel once again with another talk uh, about birds and uh, as part of the Society for the Protection of Nature's ongoing series of talks to uh, reach out to you all over the world. And it's great to see people that we have seen before, as well as a few new people coming on board today. I would like to introduce to you our speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Yoav Pillman is the director of BirdLife Israel. He is a bird ringer, or as they say in America, a bird bander with many, many years of experience. And who better to summarize this whole is issue of bird ringing or bird banding and what it is that it teaches us and how 
we can use this as a major tool to help us with bird conservation uh, all over the world. So Yoav, I'm going to hand it straight to you. And if you have questions, please send it to the Q&A and we'll deal with it at the end. Chat is disabled, but we will take all questions through the Q&A. Okay, Yoav, thank you. are there still people coming, coming in? They're, uh, they're coming in slowly, yeah, but- uh, Are we live on Facebook as well? Yeah, we're live on Facebook. All right, so let's, let's get going. Um, so yeah, hello to everyone. Uh, great to see so many uh, familiar uh, names and uh, lots of new people as well. Um, I'm happy to be here and to uh, speak to you this evening. Um, unfortunately, Yosef Kiat, who's the director of our bird ringing center, could not join us today. Uh, Yosef is uh, doing a lot of international work, mainly working in uh, museum collections. And the museum where he's at uh, now uh, doesn't have good internet connection, so he was unable to join us. Uh, he might try later, but currently he is uh, struggling to find a good connection. So uh, yeah, so I'll uh, take over, uh, which is okay because as Alan said, I've been personally involved in bird ringing since um, yeah, about 1990. So I've been ringing or bird banding since then. Uh, I worked as a chief ringer in several ringing stations for quite a few years. Um, and currently I ring mainly at the Jerusalem Bird Observatory where Alan, uh, uh, where Alan is uh, directing the Jerusalem Bird Observatory, which is a wonderful place to ring. Um, over the years, um, I've gone into ringing and a bit, um, I mean, ringing used to be my main profession for quite a few years. And then I sort of reduced the amount of birds that I ring um, in Israel and other parts of the world. And uh, I do um, a lot of uh, other things as well, uh, but I still appreciate uh, the importance of ringing. I support our network of ringing stations. And I still enjoy ringing very much. And I enjoy using the results from ringing um, for the conservation work that we do. And in the presentation today, uh, I will so I'll try to get the computer to work. OK. Um, in the presentation today, I'll try to talk about uh, what is bird ringing? Uh, what, what do we do with bird ringing? Um, I put this asterisk here after the ringing because I know that in America it's called banding. Uh, but for me, it's more natural to say ringing. So I'll keep with ringing. And also we have quite a few uh, guests in, in this talk from Europe and some from Israel and here. Uh, it's ringing as well, so we'll go with ringing. Um, so I'll um, tell uh, a bit about bird ringing and what it is and what it's all about. We'll talk about how bird ringing uh, began, um, both uh, in the world and then uh, how it started in Israel. And then I'll devote some time to talk about some of the results and applications of the bird ringing activities that we do. Uh, so let's get going. Um, please feel free to ask any questions through the Q&A and we'll try to get to as many as possible uh, um, at the end of the presentation. Come on, computer, okay. All right, so bird ringing, um, I mean, the, the dry definition, it's a research activity that involves trapping of wild birds, uh, tagging with rings, or other means and releasing back to the wild. Okay, so it's uh, basically a research activity. It can be used for other purposes, but in its basis, it's a research activity evolved by researchers and used primarily for bird research. Um, um, the classic bird ringing has um, a few aims or uh, you know, general ideas about bird ringing. 
Um, the first and the most important one, which is how actually bird ringing started, is to study migration. Bird migration has been a fascinating phenomena for uh, forever, more or less, for humans. Humans have always been fascinated by migration, and bird ringing evolved as a basic uh, and a primary uh, method to study bird migration. Um, at, at first, it was really used to track birds to get some kind of basic idea on where birds migrate to, where they breed, where they winter, and where they stop uh, during migration. And later on, it was um, used more systematically to track phenology, to understand which birds arrive at which time and what numbers in which time of year we have this and in other time of year we have that. Um, so that uh, developed in, in a later stage. Uh, bird ringing is used um, in uh, when, when working in specific places. Um, it can be used to understand better what is in that place. Bird ringing is a very important way to discover bird species that are usually not very visible through binoculars, for instance. Um, reed bed species, birds or wetland species, are very often very, very, very difficult to see. Sometimes one can hear them, but it's very difficult to observe them, certainly not to count them. Um, so when you put nets up or other means that we trap birds, you get information about those species that are very often almost impossible to find. Um, so if you want to describe what's going on in um, well-vegetated habitats, uh, still bird ringing is a very important way to do that. Uh, another important um, reason to, to do bird ringing is it allows us to target sp specific species or groups of species or populations and get demographic uh, information about them or phenological information about them, when they arrive, when they leave. And through that, um, um, create the knowledge base that is necessary often for conservation. Uh, if we want to protect species, we need to know um, to have a deep knowledge of their ecology, of their biology, and bird ringing is still an important way sort of to dive deep into the biology or ecology of a species. Um, bird, sorry. Um, okay, I'll talk a bit more about uh, the um, application of bird ringing in the migration studies. I'll elaborate a bit more. So it really started, as I said, uh, as, a, as a basic tool to identify breeding grounds and wintering zones. And to, uh, but later on, when more and more data started to accumulate, um, the understanding of where birds migrate, which flyways they use, where they stop, um, these are all. Um, uh, they all developed from the bird ringing uh, over the years. Bird ringing developed uh, fastest in Europe, in Western Europe mainly, or Central Europe. Um, and it very quickly uh, evolved into a very important tool to manage stopover sites. At a lot of stopover sites, there's bird ringing being done um, to understand what birds are doing in these stopover sites, how long they stay there how quickly they accumulate energy. Um, and many of the most important bird ringing stations around the world are uh, on these uh, islands, uh, stopover sites. One very famous uh, bird ringing station is the Heligoland Bird Observatory uh, north of Germany in the North Sea. And it's really a fantastic place. And uh, this map, um, so on the, Bottom left is a photograph of a northern wheat ear. On the right, you can see uh, all the recoveries of northern wheat ears that were ringed in Helgoland, which is where the black arrow is. And you can see how they disperse uh, to different parts of the world. Um, really a fascinating um, map uh, that is generated from one dot after the other. So each one of those dots represent 
a bird that was ringed at Helgoland and was refound, retrapped in another site over, I guess, a uh, hundred years or something like that. Um, on the right, you see a map of uh, um, migration, a bit of connectivity or uh, uh, flyways of um, flyway maps of lesser white roads. Uh, again, ringing recoveries of lesser white roads. Um, you can see. Um, they use slightly different routes in spring and in autumn. And all of this data was inferred from uh, ringing studies. Um, the, the, I'm missing the, okay. Okay, I, it's a bit uh, difficult for me to see the upper uh, line, but I'll try. Um, still, most of the bird ringing that is being done around the world is using sort of the classic method of bird ringing, uh, using mist nets, uh, those uh, transparent nets, and ringing birds with small metal rings on their legs. Uh, this is, a, as I said, a very common method worldwide, and it has a few advantages and disadvantages. Um, one of the main advantages of bird ringing is that it allows uh, the application of many, many rings at very low cost, okay? The rings themselves are very cheap, relatively, uh, and in one season or in several, or in one year, um, for instance, at the Jerusalem Bird Observatory, about 15,000 birds are ringed every year, tagged with these small uh, rings, and they fly around the world carrying those rings. Um, and it's still a very cost-effective way to, to get to know birds, to understand birds, and to slowly, slowly, slowly accumulate information about bird migration. Um, however, this um, method has some disadvantages or shortcomings, first of all. Um, there's a very strong bias in this method towards where there is more intensive bird ringing or bird reciting. Um, uh, this is a, on, on the right, you can see a map from a, a paper published by the British Trust of Ornithology showing that nine, almost 97% of the birds ringed in Europe are ringed in Western Europe or west of this uh, red dashed line and only 3% are ringed east of the dashed line. And for Israel, this is quite a big challenge because we assume that most of our birds come actually from to the right hand side of that red dashed line, but there is hardly any bird ringing there. Uh, the same goes for Africa. Um, most of the ringing is done in the Northern hemisphere and the Southern hemisphere. There's much, much, much less bird ringing. Um, in that photograph on the bottom right, um, this is how the only um, permanent bird or long-term bird ringing project in Africa, this is how it looks like. It's in, in Gulia in Eastern Kenya. It's a wonderful place. I visited there twice. Um, really a massive, massive ringing effort there going on since 1968. Uh, but it's the only place in Africa. And even though they ring 25,000 to 30,000 birds every season and their season lasts for two weeks, um, still those birds are sort of lost in the nether and the recovery rates there are very low. Um, in this map here in the center, you can see the recoveries of uh, recoveries and recitings of common terns from Israel. Um, you can see that uh, there's a very strong bias towards Central Europe. So is, here is where the birds are ringed in Israel and we get ringing uh, recoveries mainly from here, from around the Black Sea and in Central Europe. Uh, but these few indications that you see here in the East, they indicate that a significant proportion of the birds that might common turn that migrate through Israel fly northeast into Russia, but there's just so little ornithological research there uh, that they, they're never seen again. 
Um, as I said earlier, ringing is often used to understand populations of birds, population dynamics. And through ringing, uh, vital demographic information can be collected. Uh, when we catch birds and ring them, we determine their age, their sex, if possible. And if they're breathing, we look for physical, physiological signs of breathing uh, that can be seen when birds are handled. And through that, we can learn about different demographic rates, breeding success, long-term survival. And from that, uh, study populations over uh, long terms to understand their dynamics and understanding these dynamics, which birds are increasing, which birds are decreasing, is a crucial piece of information for conservation uh, strategy. Um, when we, um, well, we, this can be taken one step further. And when we're bringing into that the physiological condition of the bird, we can understand which populations are doing okay in regard to their energy, in regard to the stopover ecology, um, and to try and link um, the changes in the population dynamics with different environmental uh, variables that can be connected with their energy. For instance, if there's good rainfall and good mass accumulation or energy accumulation, um, this can be linked and all of these, uh, information, this information can be collected through bird ringing. Um, this is really, really important to understand that through bird ringing, we can really dive deep into the birds and really get uh, the most detailed information about the birds. Um, just this uh, opportunity to, to hold the birds in hand and get all the information that we need that is virtually impossible when the birds are in the field. Uh, we can measure them, all kinds of different measurements of their uh, feathers and of, the, uh, of their legs, of their bill, um, and really describe their size and their shape very accurately. We can uh, um, identify their sex, their gender, and their age more accurately than we can do in the field. In the field, um, identifying the slight differences between young birds and adults are very often very difficult. And in the hand, it's much, much easier. Uh, when birds are in the hand, we can collect different samples from them, of course, always with the necessary permits without damaging the birds. We can collect DNA samples that can be um, obtained through feathers or blood samples. Um, and uh, through feathers, we can um, track the stable isotopes in the feathers. Um, through blood samples, we can look for viruses, um, poisons or pesticides and in, in remnants in their blood. All of these can be very, very important in, in conservation efforts. Um, and, and again, diving even deeper to look for uh, signs of molt, in, in the wings or in other body parts to look for breeding signs and the physiological condition of the bird. All of these are really possible only in, when the bird is in the hand. Um, there are different ways to trap birds. Um, as I said, the, still the most widely spread method to trap birds and for bird ringing is using mist nets. These are the mist nets on the right hand side. Um, they're very transparent nets for the birds. When the birds fly into the net uh, directly, they just can't see them. Um, and it's a very, very effective method. Um, and again, um, like rings, nets are relatively cheap. And in a ringing station, we can set large numbers of nets um, running for hundreds of meters and uh, that way to catch large numbers of birds they are quite easy to, um, to operate. And they're uh, still very commonly used in most ring stations, uh, but there are many other methods to, to trap birds um, using traps, different traps, um, not quite in Israel, but uh, especially in Europe, I know there's a lot of ringing of pullers of, of chicks in, in the nest. Uh, in Israel, it's not that common, but in other countries, it certainly is. 
um, and in different with different species, um, birds uh, that molt uh, all of their uh, flight feathers simultaneously and are flightless for a short uh, for a short period, they can get caught and and ringed in a large number. This photograph on uh, the bottom left is from one of these efforts to ring a colony of flamingos in Spain. Um, just the, the, the researchers there are waiting for the right moment when uh, the largest proportion of adults are flightless and they round them and sort of trap them in a, inside a fence and then process uh, hundreds at once. Um, when we add those standard rings uh, on the bird's legs, uh, these rings cannot normally be read in the field. The, the code on the ring isn't possible to, to, to understand or to, to read in the field. In very exceptional cases with exceptional photography, it can be done, but it's very, very difficult. In most projects that we want to increase um, the rate of birds being recited, we use what we call color rings. Um, you can see here on the leg of this griffin, an Israeli ringed griffin that was recited in Georgia and an Israeli common turn that was recited in South Africa, uh, and the great white pelican from Israel that was recited in the Danube Delta in Romania. Um, so uh, in the field, in sort of normal birding conditions, through a telescope, with binoculars, and especially with a camera, it is very, very uh, feasible uh, to identify the code, this large code on a ring, uh, which is still an individual code and it allows the identification of birds and we increase the rate of uh, re retrap or reciting significantly dramatically through the use of color rings and different tags so different birds are tagged in different places on the wings around the neck on the bill um, different tags uh, and then there's the world of transmitters which is a totally new and different world, um, much more advanced technologies. Um, there is, of course, a trade-off there. Um, those tags are very, very expensive. Um, so, for instance, a tag. The, this is a tag that, uh, like a nano tag, that was attached to the to a reed warbler. One tag costs about two hundred, two hundred and fifty dollars U.S. dollars per tag. Um, and that's without the infrastructure, the station, the, the commun communication station that needs to be set up to read those tags, which costs tens of thousands of dollars. So it's quite a pricey operation. And there are all kinds of different tags. This is a tag on a turtle dove that uh, we tagged a few weeks ago in the Bechan Valley. And we're tracking them. Uh, into Africa. You can read the, their story on our website, birds.org.il. Uh, that's a GSM tag that uh, communicates with um, cellular uh, antennas. Um, this is a satellite tag on, on this rook on the right uh, with a solar panel that um, charges the battery and give it, gives the tag a longer life uh, span. And as I said, there are different nano tags, tiny tags that can can be applied on uh, sometimes the smallest smallest birds. This reed warbler weighs about 10 grams, um, so birds can certainly uh, fly around the world carrying these tags. Uh, but uh, on the one hand, this method method is very very pricey, and normally it can be applied only on larger birds. Of course, these larger uh, transmitters are much, much, much more expensive. However, the amount and uh, accuracy of data uh, received through those tags and transmitters are much, 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 much higher than when we, what we get through standard ringing. Um, in Israel and in other parts of the world as well, there are different ringing operations that can work in different ways. There are ringing stations or bird observatories that carry out usually 
long-term standardized ringing operations. Um, by standardized, I mean that the basic method that's used for trapping birds is uh, being standardized, kept the same way over um, long term, over decades usually. Um, and that data can then be used to track long-term trends. Uh, there are always surprises and always lovely things that happen when we ring in one place. This You see this uh, happy photo on the left from our Eilat uh, Bird Observatory, the Eilat uh, Birding Center, uh, of this beautiful beater trap there. Uh, but it is a stationary place with a stationary operation. Um, there's another way to, to ring birds, which is more targeted or sporadic. Uh, you know, working out of the back of a car. Um, it, it usually doesn't provide information that can be used in long-term trend analysis or something like that, but it does provide unique opportunities to understand better a place or understand better a species to get unique or special um, information. Um, it, it, the numbers are usually much lower, uh, but uh, sometimes unique things can happen in this kind of ringing. In Israel, over the last um, decade, I would say, there is a gradual process um, that more and more ringing is being done in the ringing station and less and less uh, sporadic ringing is being done. Also, it's part of uh, new regulations that we, um, we sort of moved forward, understanding that um, ringing has a cost um, and it really needs to be applied or needs to be done where uh, it is helpful, where it really contributes data to conservation, to science, uh, and sporadic ringing often isn't all the way uh, useful. Um, I'll talk a bit about the history of bird ringing. Um, so humans have been marking birds for um, quite a few centuries. Um, however, only in the late uh, 19th century in Denmark, the father, uh, Kristen Mortensen, started um, tagging birds in a slightly more commercial or professional way. Until then, the tags were very heavy um, and, not very, and not very useful, and the survival rates of birds tagged uh, with those early rings were very, very, very low. But Father Mortensen, he managed to create some kind of a new blend of metals, very lightweight, not dissimilar to the rings that are used nowadays. And he started working first on his, uh, on the starlings breeding in nest boxes at his home, and later on on other bird species. And he started receiving um, a higher rate, recovery rate, and he understood that that's probably the way to do it. And that was in 1899. And only two years later, very quickly, the first ringing station uh, in East Prussia on the uh, coast of the Baltic Sea um, was founded in Ribachi. It's still operating uh, uh, to our days now. Uh, it's a wonderful place. They catch lots of birds. Um, back then, uh, mist nets weren't produced yet, the, this method of mist netting wasn't happening yet. And uh, the bird trapping in Ribachi and then in other bird observatories as well, developed uh, using uh, large traps, sort of fly-in traps, bird flying through the open end and sort of funnel to a catching cage at the end. Um, and still a method that's operating in Ribachi and Helgoland and in many other bird observatories as well. Um, in Israel, uh, the ringing history is a bit shorter. Uh, it started with Eliezer Smoli um, before the state of Israel was actually founded. Um, Eliezer Smoli, uh, during those early years, he actually traveled to Ribachi and tried to learn how to, we, he trained in bird ringing and he tried to bring bird ringing back into Israel. And if you remember, we just said that it was still um, carried out 
mainly with large with these large traps. And it's a system that didn't really work in Israel. The infrastructure wasn't good enough, and he couldn't find the uh, the right site for that. And uh, ringing didn't really develop uh, during those early years of the, the state of Israel. But in 1959, um, there was a, a second try, and a new uh, ringing operation was started in Magan uh, I think it was a Belgian. Uh, team that came and, and trained uh, Shalom Zuaretz. He was the uh, first uh, ringer in Magan Michael. He worked then for the Israel Nature and Parks Authority, and that was already with mist nets. So mist, mist nets were used already in the 1950s, and uh, when they were brought to Israel, already bird ringing became feasible and was carried out in Magan Michael. In 1967, there's a bit of a funny or weird story of an expedition that was sent here by the Smithsonian Institute. And the story goes that it was actually an undercover CIA operation um, testing the possibility to infect birds with different biological um, agents and sending them off to Russia in spring. Many of the birds that stop over in Israel, they fly to Russia and infecting Russia with uh, who knows what. It's a nice story. Um, I don't know if there's any truth in that story. However, that team that came from the Smithsonian Institute to Eilat trained uh, Buri Agal, Yossi Leshem. You might have uh, met him in, in different webinars and presentations. Um, and uh, they founded the Eilat ringing station in 1968 based on the training that they received from the Team from the Smithsonian Institute. Um, yeah, so over the years, we've had um, large numbers of ringing recoveries from inside Israel and outside of Israel. Um, as I said, most of our recoveries are in Europe, in Central and Western Europe, and much smaller numbers are in other places. Uh, once the recoveries were reported on a piece of paper. This is a letter that Eliezer Smolly received uh, in 1944 from another um, bird enthusiast, Israel Aroni. Um, and he found him about a ring, number E123, that he found. And he's in, in a very, uh, those who can read Hebrew maybe can understand what, it's really poetry what he, he wrote here. And, and, uh, beautiful language, uh, trying to understand uh, or to, to get information about this ring. Nowadays, the ringer reports are um, um, exchanged between ringing centers through online databases, um, really by, by a click of a button, the information is retrieved from the database and sent to the relevant ringing station. So if a bird from Israel, ringed in Israel, uh, is recited or trapped for instance, in Bulgaria, as you can see in the report here in the example, um, the uh, finding information is sent from Bulgaria to the ringing station, the ringing center of Israel, and immediately the information is sent um, back to them, and it's a very, very effective system. Um, this leads me to describe to you the uh, Israel Bird Ringing Center which is up, um, directed by Yosef Kiat. Um, it's working under the umbrella of BirdLife Israel. And uh, it's a very, very important activity or project that we're running. Um, Yosef, as I said, is running it full time, but he's working with others as well. Um, one of his most important tasks is to manage the database. It's a huge database. I'll talk about it a bit later. Um, that collects all the bird ringing information from Israel. And this database needs management, uh, needs organizing uh, to make it available and uh, applied for conservation and research. Uh, the ringing center is responsible for the training, the certification and the quality control of the bird ringing operations in Israel. And the bird ringing is uh, and under the laws, it's um, the, the ringing permits are issued 
by the Israel Nature and Parks Authority. It's a government agency, uh, but they sort of certified the Society for Protection of Nature, our bird wing center, to, um, to, to be in charge of the training on of the professional certification and quality control of all of the bird ringing in Israel. Uh, another important task is the management of the ringing supplies. Only certified ringers can buy rings and nets and import them uh, into Israel. And all of that is done through the ringing center. Unfortunately, in other countries, um, illegal ring supplies, especially nets can be bought online. But in Israel, this is illegal and only um, legal supply chain through the bird wing center is uh, possible. Um, yeah, here you can see the number of birds ringed in Israel. You can see that on the left in the early 90s and, and in the 1990s and early 2000s, the numbers ringed in Israel weren't great. But I would say that since about 2006 or 2008, um, sort of the standard number of uh, ringing stations is operating. And it's not a constant effort around the country, uh, but you can see that the numbers we're ringing every year is about between 60 to 100,000. You can see some peaks. 2012 was an amazing year with an all time peak of bird migration, which was represented in the birds ring in Eilat, in Jerusalem, other ringing sites. And some birds are a bit slower, but this is more or less uh, the, the average, the yearly average, um, which isn't bad. Um, we, we, the entire birding community in Israel isn't great. And uh, the ringing community is even smaller. We have um, about 120, 130, operating ringers in Israel. About half of them can ring independently and the, the C license holders are sort of training, training to become independent ringers. So it's not a lot of ringers. And I would say out of those 60 something um, active uh, independent ringers, I would say about half of them are actually active. Uh, others, uh, they have a ringing permit but they don't really ring on a regular basis. So it's not too many ringers and uh, I think that the ratio of birds ringed per ringer in Israel is probably one of the highest in Europe and in our area, you know, which is pretty good. And it represents the large numbers of birds that migrate to Israel. Israel, as you know, from all the previous webinars is a global hotspot for bird migration and our ringing stations in Eilat and Jerusalem um, are certainly very effective in, in um, gathering data on this bird migration. Um, our bird ringing data is used in science. Um, as I said, the, the first reason or the primary reason for bird ringing is bird migration research. And there's a multitude of um, scientific studies that have been published in scientific journals uh, describing amazing phenomena and interesting things happening happening in Israel, identified in Israel, um, and a lot of uh, work in recent years is being done linking bird migration phenology with climate change. Uh, and bird ringing is used in these studies because of this um, standardized uh, effort used in the bird ringing stations uh, that can allow, allow long-term trend analysis and then linking that with uh, um, climate variables is uh, something that's developing quite uh, significantly in recent years. Um, yeah, here are a few examples for some long-term studies. So this is like the representation of the data and on the right-hand side. Um, this is the total number of birds ringed in a lot in autumn and fall. And there's a significant decrease in the number of autumn migrants through a lot. This is uh, the willow warbler is one example uh, of birds that significantly um, uh, decreased in a lot in autumn. In spring, the numbers there are pretty stable, but in autumn something is happening there, and it's not. I mean, if anything, 
the habitat is only improving at the a lot bird park and so this is really some change in numbers or in migration routes we don't know the full story yet but this is an indication um, on the left you can see uh, the ringing data from the Jerusalem Bird Observatory for Black Cap, uh, one of the commonest migratory warblers in Israel. And um, the long term trend at the Jerusalem Bird, the Bird Observatory is more or less stable. Um, you can see the difference uh, between the two lines. Between uh, the blue line is the total number of birds trapped every year in spring. And the green line is an index, uh, bringing into account the difference in the numbers of uh, ringing days uh, during uh, the ringing season. So in the early years, during migration season in spring, there wasn't daily ringing. And since I think 2007, there's daily ringing. Um, so this green line brings that into account. Um, Another important and uh, worrying result that we received recently from the Jerusalem Bird Observatory is an indication that the resident uh, birds of the city, the city birds that used to be common um, are now uh, less common. Uh, the blackbird is one example, but blackbird, great tit, hoopoe, um, a few species have more or less disappeared from Jerusalem like goldfinch. Um, this can be attributed to many different changes to climate change, to the um, intense, the increase in the inten or the intensification of habitats inside Jerusalem. Jerusalem used to be a much wilder city with more habitat for migrant birds, and nowadays uh, the Jerusalem Bird Observ Observatory is a wonderful island of uh, wild habitat in the middle of the city, but all of the surrounding is becoming more and more intensive and we can see uh, possibly the, this link but with the bird trends um and yeah those birds they get rings on their legs and they fly to all kinds of amazing places and they give us these amazing glimpses to to their migration um uh, they, they really are migration heroes, some of those birds, and we really get a lot of surprises from bird ringing. One of these examples is blackwing stilt. Blackwing stilt um, breeds in Israel, probably some are migrants. Um, I would say that, you know, as, as birders, certainly as bird ringers, we don't pay too much attention to the species, to blackwing stilt. We, we think of them as more or less resident birds, but from the very few, uh, black wing stills that were ever ringed in Israel. We have two um, long distance recoveries in two totally different directions, one in southeastern Europe and another one in central western Africa in Gambia, where this photograph on the left was uh, taken. Um, so yeah, so it's um, quite an exciting species to work on and we want to get more data on them to understand what exactly they're doing, because we still don't really know enough. Um, this is an example for um, a scientific study that was uh, sort of prompted by bird ringing, the early days of Yosef Kiat at the Jerusalem Bird Observatory. He's, there's a small population of long-eared owls in, in a wood adjacent to the bird observatory. And in some parts of the year, they feed on migratory birds. And Yosef started collecting pellets uh, of those owls and looking through them and finding rings. And he found a significant numbers of rings. That means that the, the owls catch and eat ring birds at night. And those birds were ringed and he could link what he found in those pellets with what the birds were um, in the field, in, in, in the bird ring. And he discovered that the owls prefer young birds. They catch or, or they have higher catch rates of young birds. Maybe the young birds are less experienced in avoiding long-eared owls at night and they get caught by those owls more. This is the example that you can see in this table below. Um, 
yeah, some ringing projects are very intensive and those intensive projects uh, bring amazing results. One of the projects that we're most, um, most proud of is the TURN project. Um, the Israeli TURN project operates in Atlit. There's a salt factory in Atlit and we have a collaboration there with the salt factory and with the Israel Nature and Parks Authority to protect the breeding colonies there of common tern and little tern. Both species are threatened in Israel and there's intensive conservation work to protect their breeding colonies. Um, and one of those efforts is to understand their demography, their population dynamics. And they are ringed there with color rings and those birds, uh, so, well, I mean, there is a breeding colony there, but the ringing there identified that the athlete salt pans are also a globally important stopover site for migratory common tern that winter in uh, well, off Southern Africa. And you can see this map on the right hand side where they disperse to um, in, uh, in Europe around the Black Sea and Western Europe, some reach all the well, quite uh, far away to the west of Europe, a few records in Russia, and there are just a handful of records in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, in Southern Africa, um, one in India, one in Yemen, so quite amazing stuff done by these common terms. Um, some species are very popular among bird ringers and about color and among color ring readers. Uh, one of these species is black stork. Black storks are iconic species in Europe, um, sort of con often uh, con of conservation concern, are, are very charismatic, um, and many chicks are ringed in, in the nest. This is a, a nest in the Czech Republic on the right. Uh, this is a chick ring there. And then a few years later, you can see this chick here in the middle when it's already mature, uh, walking uh, around with this ring. This ring can be read with a telescope. Um, and we have a lot of color ring readings from Israel of birds ringed in Europe, in different parts of Europe. Um, until a few years ago, there were teams of Europeans that used to come here to Israel and sort of uh, intensively search for color rings. Uh, during migration, during this time of year, more, mostly. Uh, one guy, Carsten Rode from Germany, he was like, a, he had bionic eyes and he managed to read amazing numbers of uh, rings on these black storks. But they stopped coming to Israel before COVID and they didn't resume their efforts. So in recent years, we have slightly less data from uh, black storks, but already all the data we have over the years can you know, we have very good confidence in knowing where these birds come from. Um, yeah, and this color ringing um, opens a new world of bird migration for us and gives us some amazing examples. One of the record holders we have in Israel is a common ring plover that was sighted on the beach in Magan Michael, um, photographed by a photographer. Um, and she, Katya is her name. She sent us this photo and through this combination of the ring and the tag on the leg, we identified this bird um, and we tracked it to where it was ringed in um, Kamchatka, almost in America, very close to the Bering States, the Bering Straits. And just to reach to Israel, it migrated in a direct line which obviously it didn't take, but if it flew in a direct line, it would be almost 9,000 kilometers. And then those birds migrate down to Southern Africa. So it certainly could be a, a world record holder in, in overland migration, um, something like 17, 18,000 kilometers each way. Quite amazing for a bird that weighs 30, 40 grams, the common ring plover. Um, I talked about uh, sporadic ringing uh, earlier. Um, yeah, sometimes it's uh, it's not very effective, but sometimes it does lead to amazing and exciting discoveries. Um, when I was ringing in the Hula uh, ringing station for a few years, I was the chief ringer there. 
um, and we, uh, we, the team, we lived in one kibbutz and then we had to change our accommodation to another kibbutz. We ring in the hula, in the Agamon hula in the morning. In the afternoon, I was bored and I was looking for occupation in the afternoon. And on our first afternoon in the new uh, accommodation in Kibbutz Lavot Abashan, we went to the fish pond just across the road from the kibbutz and we stuck some nets up and boom, we found Basra reed warbler, a globally endangered species. It was the first time it was found breeding in Israel. We found there a tiny breeding population. It was the first time they were found breeding away from uh, the marshes of Southern Iraq. It was, uh, yeah, it was quite a global um, sensation. Um, went on media in Israel and globally as well. It was really uh, quite a fascinating discovery, uh, very exciting. And I was very lucky to be there at the right place at the right time, together with the, the late Amit Geffen. And um, yeah, since then they dwindled. So they bred there for two, three years and they, then they stopped breeding. We don't know exactly what happened there, uh, but it was amazing to see them for two or three years there. Um, yeah, so that's the story of the Basra reed warbler. Um, yeah, as you know, um, around Israel, in the countries around Israel, there is very, very intensive bird trapping and bird shooting and bird killing. Uh, there are all kinds of different studies and trying to estimate the numbers of this large scale illegal killing of birds. Um, the numbers are crazy. And among those millions and millions of birds killed in the countries around us, sometimes some of those birds carry rings. Um, it's not easy to get the information from countries, for instance, like Lebanon or Syria. Sometimes through a third party, we manage to get information. I guess that usually we don't get the information. Sometimes uh, it has happened so many times that the birds, especially if um, I don't know, a pelican or a vulture carrying a transmitter, those birds more than once were accused of being spies for Israel and carrying uh, all kinds of uh, devices uh, to, to spy on them. Um, yeah, not the best way of cross-border collaboration that we'd want to, to do, but uh, this is what's going on in our neighborhood. Um, yeah, another example of the application of ringing in uh, very, very advanced scientific research. Uh, there's a long-term research group working on Arabian babbler. It was founded by the late professor Amot Zehavi. And there's still a, a very, very active research group operating in Khatseva, understanding the social networks of this fascinating bird, the Arabian babbler. Um, the birds are color ring to uh, um, identify them individually and uh, track uh, during their development and everything. So this is uh, um, here, this is an example of the ring that's used uh, as a mean to, to track the birds, to tag them and to follow them through their lives. Um, as I said, the Ringing Center operates a ringing database. Uh, currently, it has information about more than a million birds that uh, have been ringed and tagged in Israel. Over 7,500 recoveries. Uh, for us, a recovery is a bird that was uh, retrapped or recited 10 kilometers or more from the ringing site. But um, interestingly, we have many, many more international recoveries um, than short distance recoveries in Israel. Uh, so a lot of stuff uh, gets, uh, well, a lot more stuff gets caught or recited um, in Europe, mainly in other uh, parts of the world. Um, uh, just uh, to, uh, to stress, uh, all of these data are available to researchers, researchers that are interested in uh, ringing data from Israel can contact the Israeli Ring Center and request their data. And we always are happy to provide the ringing details uh, to um, our fellow researchers. Um, yeah, and what next? What are we planning to do next uh, with uh, the ringing station, with the ring center? Um, the ring center is 
constantly evolving to develop uh, new directions, new applications for science, for conservation. Um, and we are looking, uh, Yosef and me and our collaborators uh, at the Israel Nature and Parks Authority, we're looking on how to make the bird ringing more relevant, more effective, more applied. Um, that's very important. Um, another very important application for bird ringing, mainly at, mainly at bird observatories, is the opportunity to demonstrate bird ringing to the public at the Jerusalem Bird Observatory in Eilat. Tens of thousands of visitors uh, visit those sites and learn about nature, about conservation, about research through bird ringing. And we're very uh, keen to continue that. And we're also keen to further develop bird research, migration research at those bird observatories. Uh, those bird observatories are very important for us as sort of a hub for bird research and we'll continue to develop. Um, we are continuously trying to uh, improve the professionalism of the bird ringers in Israel, understanding the importance of the data collected and we need to strive all the time for higher and higher quality. So uh, the Ring Center is developing more advanced training courses. Uh, and we're also with the use of, of technologies, we're trying to be become better connected with the world, contribute our data, receive data from other countries. And uh, it's really important to walk that way. Alan, you're muted. We're almost done. Uh, this is an example of uh, data that we um, contributed to the uh, Euring Bird Migration Atlas. The, these are data from Lesser White Throat, um, including data from Israel. And uh, this is a dynamic effort. So all the time, more and more information is contributed. So we want to do more and more collaborative stuff. Um, yeah, and the, that's the end of my presentation. And I see that there are many questions in the Q&A. We'll get to them in a minute. I just wanted to, um, first of all, thank you for joining this presentation. I hope you learned something about bird ringing in Israel, the importance of bird ringing. Um, and I am uh, asking you here to consider supporting us. Your support uh, is very important. Whatever you, you can give, uh, would allow us to do more, to do better training, to get better data, to reach more people, to demonstrate the importance of bird ringing to more people, to kids, to young adults, to researchers, to students. Everything that you can give uh, would be very, very much appreciated. Please consider using uh, the link. Um, Alan plunked the link in the uh, chat box or in the Q&A, uh, so you can reach it through there. Um, you can find this link also on our website, birds.org.il. Um, yeah, so please uh, consider supporting us. Thank you very much in advance. Um, and yeah, we have time for questions and answer. Alan, do you want to manage that Q&A session? Sure, I just want to add one, one more goal. Uh, you talked about training new, new staff and, and advanced training. And of course, one of my goals in, in Israel is to push forward um, women bird watchers and women researchers. And unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, we have very few female ringers. And so sure. that is also something that we are, we are putting an effort into removing, helping to remove the barriers that will help uh, women to, to, to enter the field and to, and to advance in the field. So we do have some questions. One of the first questions was, do you see any health risks for ringers, bird flu and other diseases? Um, so a, a year ago, we had a serious outbreak of bird flu in Israel. It hit mainly cranes in the Hula Valley. Um, during that outbreak, together with the Israel Nature and Parks Authority, we uh, stopped ringing in Israel. All of the ringing activities in Israel were stopped for a couple of months uh, because of the risk uh, that we we fear that um, even though the risk to get infected 
from a, a, a migratory passerine is very, very close to zero. We were sort of overcautious um, and we decided to reduce the risk uh, or to, to eliminate the risk. Um, especially we're working with wetland birds. It's not only bird flu. We always do think about hygiene. We always, you know, um, are very strict about not eating um, during bird ringing. Before eating, we always wash our hands properly. With bird flu, without bird flu, we always try to, uh, to uh, keep high hygiene. Um, and it's important, as I said, especially for wetland birds that can carry all kinds of other diseases. Um, that's, that's one thing, but, but it's really important to understand. Migratory birds, um, because of the huge physiological pressure, stress of uh, bird migration, the, the huge effort, if a bird is ill, only slightly ill, it will probably not make it through migration. So we're pretty confident that migratory birds like the warblers uh, we ring at the Jerusalem Bird Observatory, we are very confident that they're healthy and, and we're not concerned about health issues for the ringers. That's uh, that's the general idea. Um, there was a question about whether the transmitters uh, interfere with mating. Of the birds. Okay, um, there are there have been many 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 studies um, looking at different survival rates and um, demographic rates of birds with transmitters versus birds without transmitters, and I couldn't and, and there there are no indications if um, the attachment of the uh, transmitter is done properly. Um, there, is, there shouldn't be any effect on the survival or the breathing of those birds. It's really important to understand that it's not an easy, easy um, job to attach transmitters. A lot of tra training is needed and supervision by experienced uh, people. Um, and you, one needs special permits to, to apply tags and transmitters on birds. It's not an easy uh, job and again we're constantly looking on how to improve the professionalism of those who, who use bird tagging and uh, apply transmitters on birds in Israel. So the um, this is a big question uh, how could climate change cause change in migratory routes have we seen any changes and has the rewilding that's going on in Israel increase the number of birds of any species? Okay. So I think that could be a whole um, yeah, discussion. Yeah, uh, everything we do at uh, the SPNI, more or less, in, in two minutes. Yeah. Um, so um, climate change has many ways it could affect migratory birds. One of the things we're looking at through ringing is the phenology of migration. When birds start their migration, um, when they leave the breeding grounds uh, on, on their way south and when they leave their winter, wintering grounds to arrive back uh, on their breeding grounds in spring. Um, we have different studies that have been carried out in Israel um, at our bird ringing stations in Jerusalem and in Eilat. And uh, so we found that some species certainly have changed their migration phenology. Blue throat is one species that is arriving earlier in autumn and also earlier in spring, the big migration of them, the distinct migration waves. Other species seem to be very stable. They haven't changed. And it's an interesting direction of, my, of, of migration studies to understand why species respond differently to climate change. And it's still an ongoing study. Um, about the rewilding activities. So we started rewilding um, only a year and a half ago or two, wild, two years ago in Farupin, in Magal Michael. Um, I think it will take a few more years until we see population scale impact. And also we need to increase the area that we're rewilding. At the moment, it's two pilot projects that are 
wonderful and important and interesting to study, but the regional impact of those projects is not huge yet. We need to increase our impact regionally and over time. And I hope that over the years, we'll uh, actually see the impact on bird populations, but we're not there yet. And get back to us in 10, 15 years. I think it's always important to point out that we are in Israel sort of in the middle of the migration route. So some of the, the wild changes in timing and so on that are being seen at the at the wintering grounds and at the um, especially in the breeding grounds to the north, we're not quite seeing the swing of the pendulum here. We're we're sort of the 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 center of of of, of it all. Um, so we can track stuff, but the the, the the range of movement of some of it is not quite as big as in other places. Um, but Israel continues to be a major stopover for, for most of these birds that are trans that are traveling through and from. So any time we can rewild or provide natural habitat is going to help the, the populations uh, north and south of us to, um, to not decrease any further. Uh, so it's a major, major job that we have here. Regarding the local birds at the Jerusalem Bird Observatory, um, you know, 50% decrease in 25 years. A lot of that is also habitat. And so it makes what we do in preserving habitat even more important. Um, I like to say we need to try to keep common birds common. And uh, the bird ringing really helps us uh, understand what, what's going on with not just the migratory birds, but our common birds here in Israel. Thank you so much, Yoav. It's uh, always uh, nice to summarize what's going on and hear you. Uh, we will be back with more lectures and webinars. Uh, so keep uh, keep um, keep an eye on your emails and your what's on your Facebook uh, messages because we will be sending out more information as we go along. And again, if you uh, enjoyed this webinar, uh, enjoyed what we uh, talked about today, please consider uh, supporting us. This work is very important and um, it helps us to do all the conservation work that we do. So your support is always uh, appreciated. Uh, and again, we've posted the, the link on the chat, but you can also find us on our websites or send us an email. Have a good night or good or good afternoon wherever you are and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night.